Welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this talk entitled Making the Himalaya Oozing, Squashing or Sliding. My name is David Shilston, I'm a president of the Society and it's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker this evening, Matt Cole. Uh, Dr Matthew Cole um, attended MIT and graduate school at the Re Re Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York where he received his PhD in 1991. After a series of research positions, he advanced to assistant professor and then associate professor at the University of South Carolina before joining the faculty at Boise State University in, in uh, Idaho, where he's currently university <sighs> distinguished professor. Dr. Cohen is distinguished lecturer of the Mineralogical Society of America for 2012-2013, and it's in this capacity that we hear him today. The collision between India and Asia not only raised Earth's highest mountain range, the Himalayas, and the largest plateau, Tibet, but in so doing fostered lively debate into the physical behaviour of continental crust during plate collisions. The occurrence of high temperature metamorphic rocks in the core of the Himalaya, bounded by lower temperature rocks both above and below, has engendered several models of how the middle crust deforms, including oozing, squashing and sliding. I feel sure these hypotheses are a lot more technical, but surely no less delicious than they sound. Matt is going to favour us with his opinions on these cutting edge ideas today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matt Cole. Thank you. Oh, very good. Well, well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. It's a, it's a tremendous honour and privilege to talk about this research. I have been working on Himalayan projects for almost 15 years now, and um, so this is really the, the culmination of uh, quite a long series of projects that I've had. Um, as mentioned, I'm here uh, in part through the Mineralogical Society of America. I do want to talk about um, MSA for, for a minute, especially because they're paying my transportation. Um, I love Mineralogical Society of America. It's the first society I ever joined. I swear it is not a bunch of stuffy old mineralogists. It's got a bunch of exciting mineralogists, as well as petrologists and geochemists who, uh, who make this up. They have wonderful, wonderful publications. Um, if you join every couple of months, you get Elements Magazine, which tells you, it's an, it's an update of what this, the different um, mineral, mineralogy and geochemical societies are doing. And then they have series of articles on topics, like this one is on tourmaline, they have other ones on geochronology, economic elements, things like that. Reviews in mineralogy and geochemistry is, in, in my view, um, the best value for the dollar for publications in the geosciences. Um, they, have, they have textbooks, they have their, uh, their periodical. Um, for students, it's, it's, uh, it is really phenomenal. If you know students or if you're a student yourself, um, MSA has research grants. Um, if you're a member as a student, you get a discount. Uh, you get a free subscription to Elements, and you get member registration rates at, at some of the meetings. Um, student registration, uh, student membership is, is quite cheap. When I was a student, it was $10 a year. I think it's now $20 a year. Um, but at any rate, it is, it's, uh, quite a fun, it is a wonderful society to belong to, and, it's, and it has great benefits for students. And since, uh, especially here, many, many people don't really know where I come from, I thought I would talk a little bit about my department. They, of course, are letting me go for um, almost three weeks now to give lectures across uh, North America and the British Isles. We have three different groups. There are 15 of us, 15 tenure-track faculty, split into three different uh, areas. Shallow geophysics, they look at the upper 100 meters of Earth's crust, including snow and soil and so on. We have surface processes group, geomorphology, um, hydrology, um, various sorts of modeling. So I put this up in part, th this is a storm track into Boise, Idaho. That's where I live, Boise. This is Idaho, uh, Oregon, Washington, California. And then there's the Orogenic Systems Group, which is really high temperature, um, classical geology. It includes sedimentology, ge high temperature geochemistry, petrology, structural geology. <laughs> For MSA, I, give, I uh, have offered two different lectures. One is on the making of the Himalaya, um, and so that means I'm belonging to the Orogenic Systems group. The other one has to do with the uptake of trace elements in fossil bones and teeth. 
And so that is actually when I'm in the surface processes group. But like I said, I'm going to be talking about the Indo-Asian collision today, and so I'm pretty squarely in the orogenic systems group, at least for the next hour or so. Okay, so as many of you probably realize, India is moving northward with respect to stable Siberia, way up here somewhere, at a rate of about four to five centimeters per year, and it has been doing this for the last 50 million years, um, colliding the Indian subcontinent with Asia. Um, the amount of uh, convergence, so that's you know two big continents and they're, and they're moving forward together. That convergence is taken up across a lot of different structures. One of them is the Himalaya, this, this mountain range that runs along through here. And out of that four to five centimeters per year, about one or two is taken up across the, the Himalaya. The red stars are uh, places that I have worked, so I'll be talking about rocks from central Nepal, northwest India, and in Bhutan. Um, so if we look at a geologic map of the Himalaya, so here's the, here's the range of the Himalaya, Tibet is, is back up in here. The way I think about this is with respect to um, three large-scale rock packages. And those three large-scale rock packages, we talk about structurally low rocks, intermediate rocks, and high rocks as we move upward, both in elevation and in stratigraphy and, what we, and, and structure. And what we see are the lesser Himalayan rocks, which are shown here in blue. They're in blue here. Uh, the greater Himalayan uh, rocks, greater Himalayan sequence, shown here in orange. And along here, you can see it going all the way along the, the arc of the, of the collision zone and Tethian Himalayan rocks shown here in brown. Now these big packages of rocks are bounded by large through-going uh, shear structures. And so if we look at the Tethian Himalayan rocks against greater Himalayan rocks, they are juxtaposed across a structure that's called the South Tibetan Detachment System. And it basically down drops rocks of the Tethian um, down against the greater Himalayan rocks. Now underneath it, the greater Himalayan rocks here are juxtaposed against lesser Himalayan rocks along a thrust fault. So these rocks are being moved upward and outward relative to the lesser Himalayan rocks. The last structure that I think I make reference to in this is the main Himalayan thrust. That's this guy under here. Um, it's the detachment zone that separates this wedge of material from down going India. So this is all India. Asia is back over here somewhere. And the concept is that all of these thrust faults soul into the main Himalayan thrust. So these are different faults that are, that are coming off of, of that. So the three main packages, um, Tethian, Greater, uh, Lesser, and then the structures, South Tibetan Detachment System, and Main Central Thrust, with opposite senses of movement. So the basic question I'm trying to answer is, does the squishy mid-lower crust flow? That's what this all comes down to. And there are two perspectives. I, 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 maybe I should apologize that this is a, a I, I do try to use non-technical terms, but there is certainly a technical component to this talk. One of the things that I do is I look at models of orogenesis, models of how the crust behaves, where rocks are moving around, how they move around. And I compare them to um, those models and their predictions to the observations that we make. And so as a metamorphic petrologist, geochronologist, I'm looking at the pressures and temperatures that the rocks record, what the models predict, the temperature time history of these rocks, how rapidly they heat or cool relative to what we see in, uh, in the rocks. Okay, so um, the, the world in which I, I live, the tectonics, uh, uh, world has separated itself out into these two different camps. And the two camps are now labeled the critical taper ta camp and the channel flow camp. So this is a model that was developed by Tony Dolan and um, colleagues at Princeton University in the mid-late 1980s, summarized in a review paper here. And the channel flow is a newer model uh, proposed by uh, Chris Beaumont, Becky Jamison, and, and many other colleagues. Um, a little over 10 years ago. Um, these are the two end member models that people talk about. There's another model called Orogenic Collapse that Clark Birchfield and Wiki Royden uh, first published on 
in the mid-1980s. Basically, what orogenic collapse says is you build up some thick wedge of material, and then at some point, if you change the, the physical controls on it, the boundary conditions or mechanical properties, it will squash. It will collapse under its own weight. So those are the, those are the three different models. Uh, this becomes sliding, this becomes oozing, and this becomes squashing. And how do we distinguish these? Well, there are lots of different ways that geologists test models. One of the ways is we can look at the structural evolution. How do those big faults form? How do they evolve through time? How rapidly are they moving? Um, and so on. Um, I'm a metamorphic petrologist. We can look at the pressures and temperatures that the rocks uh, form at and how they evolve. And in geochronology, we can look at the temperatures and the times that these rocks achieve those temperatures. I am not a structural geologist, so there are certain features of the structure that are consistent with um, various uh, permutations of those models, but I'm not going to talk about the structure other than to refer to the South Tibet detachment system at, at the top and these, these big thrust faults down at the bottom. I will say that uh, channel flow, is, as, we, uh, as I discuss later, and I'll, and I'll describe what these models are in a, in a few minutes, um, but channel flow, I think, um, it, it really does a very good job of explaining why there is a big extensional structure at the top of the Himalaya in what is otherwise a collisional origin. You know, you, you would think everything would be overthrust, and yet there's this whopping big normal sense shear zone at the top. Why is that? Channel flow explains that uh, pretty simply. Okay, so questions to keep in mind. Now, this is my view as a metamorphic petrologist and geochronologist. Where is the heat, and how does it move around? And that's one of the things I'm going to emphasize. I'm going to show you cross sections of the crust, different models. I'm going to show you where the hot rocks are. I'm going to show you where the cold rocks are. And the thing to keep in mind is how do the hot rocks move around? And how does that affect the rocks around them? So that's one theme to think about. The second theme, which is implicit to everything that I do, is how do we use chemical and isotope zoning and metamorphic minerals to study tectonics? So metamorphic minerals, minerals that crystallize in the cores of mountain belts at elevated temperature and pressure. Um, how do we use the chemistry and isotopes in, in those sorts of materials to learn about tectonic processes? And in case I, I don't make this point sufficiently emphatically, the data that I have collected, I have by no means seen that much of the Himalaya. You've seen the places that I've been. It's distributed across the Himalaya, but it's really only a few, a few places. Um, I think channel flow has, um, it can explain certain features of the of structure. There, there are structural geologists who, are, who would argue with me about that. There are certain features of the structure that are not well explained by channel flow. Um, but the bottom line is, from my perspective, it does not do a great job of explaining the pressures, temperatures, and ages of the metamorphic rocks that we see. The critical taper model really does explain the pressure, temperature, and time evolution, but it doesn't really do a good job of explaining structures. It, it has trouble in explaining what the South Tibetan detachment system is all about. Um, but if you combine flattening or squashing with critical taper, then you can explain certain features of the South Tibetan detachment system in the, in the context of these different models. So what are these models? OK, so let's talk about channel flow first. Um, so channel flow um, says here, you know, so here's our cross section of the crust. So this is depth in the crust. This is distance. So this would be India over here. This is the Tibetan plateau back here. And what channel flow says, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a, it's a interesting concept. I like this concept a lot in principle. It says that if there is an erosional front, so the topographic front of the Himalaya today has a lot of precipitation and erosion at it. If you have an erosional front here, so you're removing material outward, and you have weak material back here. Weak, why is it weak? Because it's hot and because it's undergone partial melting reactions. then these two can couple together and the hot material can flow forward towards the orogenic front, towards the mountain front. So by removing this material, this hot stuff has a place to flow and it flows outward. Now, um, 
in this model, if this is flowing forward, well, it has a thrust sense displacement along the bottom of the channel, and it has a normal sense displacement on the top of the channel. So it's a good way of explaining the, uh, the origin of the South Tibetan detachment system. Why do you have this particular geometry shear zone? It's a consequence of channel flow. Um, if you want to think about this in terms of pistons, this is one way I think about it. So if you've got some soft material that's, that's in a tube or a channel or a flat sheet or something like that, and you're removing, you're pulling this piston out because you're eroding material away, then um, some piston somewhere else has to go down. But this material is going to flow forward towards the place where that piston is being removed. That's, that's what this is all about. And this is the thermal picture of what happens. So now this is depth in the Earth's crust. This is distance from the, the thrust front. Um, all of these different lines are different temperatures, 800 degrees uh, Celsius to 200 degrees Celsius. Anywhere you see red, that, those are rocks that are hot enough to have become partially melted and become very weak. So they are, in principle, are capable of flowing. And so what you see is that here's our, here's our thrust. This stuff starts to move forward. It's, it's uh, pushed forward towards the erosional front. You get the South Tibetan detachment system going on here. And here is the important point that I'll, I'll be coming back to. Look at how the heat is transported. These are hot rocks back here, and they are moved forward, and they are moved forward almost to the erosional front. They come very close to the surface within about 10 or 15 kilometers. Okay, that'll be different than critical taper, which I'll describe in a minute. Here's critical taper. I think of critical taper as being a bit like a snowplow. This is actually taken directly from uh, Tony Dolan's paper. So if you have some sediment and you've got some gigantic continent-scale tractor that's plowing it up, then what happens is, uh, depending on the mechanical properties of the sediment, um, or rock, whatever it may be, and the friction along the base here and the velocity at which this is moving, various physical properties, you end up with a wedge of material that has a particular geometry. The geometry is the consequence of all these material properties. And if you don't do anything, you just keep plowing and plowing and plowing, the wedge has the same geometry, it just gets bigger and bigger with time. Well, Wedges don't really do that, right? You build up a mountain range and things start to erode. And so the concept here then is if you have distributed erosion, so here's our, our uh, snowplow with the guy with, the, with an umbrella, and the material that's being added into the wedge is balanced by the material that's being eroded and moved out somewhere, then you end up with a wedge of a, of, at steady state. It has a particular size and geometry that doesn't change through time. Now, what actually happens in detail is uh, uh, Tony has, has proposed this kind of model. This is Taiwan. So this is depth in the Earth's crust. This is distance back from the thrust front over there somewhere. And what you see is a series of in-sequence thrusts. So this material, you're basically adding a block of material into the wedge, another block, another block, another block, and so on. That is adding to the volume of the wedge, and then the wedge is eroding off the top to maintain its geometry. That's critical taper. And this is the thermal picture that you get. So here is our wedge of material out here. These are temperatures, uh, 800 degrees, so on all the way back to 200 degrees. And, what, and anything that is um, red or orange in here is at a high enough temperature to have partially melted. We know the partial melting reactions. It's a, it's a Muscovite dehydration melting reaction, for those of you who care. We know the temperature at which that occurs. And that temperature is just around about 700 degrees. So these rocks are partially melted. Now, there are a couple things to notice about this. If you remember back to the channel flow model, these really hot rocks, they started out back here, but they ended up over here. This critical taper model is a steady state system, right? The wedge is in steady state. These hot rocks never make it out this far. Um, in fact, the particle paths are such that a rock, it gets buried, it comes through, it, it's heating up as, it, as it's going underneath this thrust. It gets underplated, the, the thrust surface comes down, it, the, the wedge adds that block of material to it. 
um, it comes back out uh, and, and comes back up to the surface. Um, and so this rock sees high temperatures back here, but it cools off before it, before it gets that far out. You will notice there is no South Tibetan detachment system in here. That is not an inherent property of critical wedges. Like I said, there are ways to do that, uh, but it's not something that you necessarily predict a priori, certainly not in a steady state system. Food analogies. <laughs> it's getting on towards dinner time. I'm thinking about food. Here are my views of, of uh, what these models are. Um, channel flow is like a chocolate lava cake. So here's a Tibetan plateau back there in the, in the back part of the origin. Um, it's got some hot, gooey material in there. And if you, can, if you don't do anything, it'll just sit there and cool off, right? But if you create an opening, if you erode a hole into these stiffer rocks, the softer rocks will ooze forward. Okay? That's what channel flow is all about. These rocks are moving forward. And let me tell you, this is pretty hot. <laughs> the rocks we're talking about moving forward in the Himalaya are pretty hot. I couldn't come up with a great example of uh, critical taper, but I did. I thought this was funny. A banana slipping on a banana peel. But basically, the rocks are slipping and sliding on their way forward, and it is. Uh, it doesn't have the same heat that you see in in a uh, in a chocolate lava cake or the channel flow model. Well, there's an exhibition next door, right? And when I was an undergraduate, I took an, uh, an art course. And I've always been impressed with artists. Artists are, you know, they're visionaries. They see things long before the rest of us ever see this. The same is absolutely true of channel flow versus critical taper. So if you think about channel flow, Salvador Dali got it right back in the 1930s. So persistence of memory, these things are just kind of oozing their way through life. Um, that's the newer model, right? The, this painting from 1931. Earlier, um, Picasso uh, made this painting, A Girl with a Mandolin. There's a bit of irony here because I actually play mandolin. But the bottom line here is that these materials are slipping and sliding on discrete structures. And so it's in a state of, of collapse. You know, the whole thing is kind of you know, moving around. And this is, this is sort of my artistic rendition of what uh, critical taper might look like. Um, so the third thing that I was talking about, this modifier to the system, is the orogenic collapse. Here is, uh, again, cross-section of the crust, India, Asia. Here's our wedge. Um, the whole wedge is in orange here, but it's not all partially melted. Um, this is effectively a modification to critical taper. And it, what it basically says is that, so you build up this wedge sitting here like this. If you change the material properties, you change the strength of the, the, the friction on the basal thrust, you change something about that snow plow that's in the back that's, that's pushing against it, then you can change the equilibrium geometry of the, of the wedge. And one possibility is it changes in such a way that the wedge wants to be thinner. If it thins, then it will collapse. And the point that, um, that C.J. Northrop is making here he argues that it's a basal weakening event. It's not the only way to do this. But his argument, his point is that this thinning can occur by different mechanisms in different places. You can either have um, faults or shear zones up here that are sliding blocks of rock around. Or if you go into the middle of the wedge, you may actually see homogeneous flattening. Because you won't see a discrete structure. It will be distributed over some thickness of the crust. OK, so that's the, that's the third sort of modifier, the, the squashing part, orogenic collapse. Well, you have to have a food analogy for this, tomatoes. Tomatoes. So what happens if you look at the skin, the skin is tearing, right? So you see the skin is torn there. Those are these brittle features up here. And the pulp and the seeds are sort of flattening down. That's, that's the interior part here. And you want to guess that artists have figured this out too? So. Here, for example, is Modigliani's uh, female head clearly flattened from in a, in a lateral sense. OK, I, one thing I want to make absolutely clear, there is no question that there are or were hot rocks in the Himalaya and that they were capable of, they were capable of flowing. Whether they did flow is an open question. This is, uh, we call it a migmatite. It's a rock that has partial melts in it. So these are little melt pockets. They've been squeezed out of the surrounding rock. They haven't gone very far. 
Um, but this is a rock that at its maximum temperature had melt in it. This is another one. This is a little melt pocket uh, from Nepal, northwest India. And here are some structures. So here are some shears that are running through this rock. These are extensional shears. They're ductile. And here are thrust sense shears, uh, also ductile from, uh, from Nepal. That's the question. Do these hot rocks matter? Channel flow says yes. That the, the, the surface processes that go on in the front of the wedge couple to these weak rocks. And those weak rocks become absolutely fundamental to the evolution of the mountain belt. And critical taper says no. That they're, they're sitting there, but they're, they're basically passively carried on other structures. And they don't, by themselves, uh, influence the, the structure. Let me show you some pictures. I've talked a lot about background. Um, this is what it looks like in northwest India. Lesser Himalayan rocks here, greater Himalayan rocks here, Tethian Himalayan rocks on the, on the backside of, of this mountain. So here we're, looking, we're down low, and we're looking up, up and up and up towards the Tethian Himalayan rocks. That's what it looks like in northwest India. Here's what it looks like in central Nepal. So here's lesser Himalayan rocks, greater Himalayan rocks back here, and there's a bit of Tethian Himalayan rocks back there. In Bhutan, so in the eastern Himalaya, there's an unusual um, disposition of rocks so that we don't have, that you can certainly look north and, and see these same kinds of rocks. I haven't worked in that area. Where I've worked, you can actually look off to the west, you can stand on greater Himalayan rocks, and you can see Tethian Himalayan rocks uh, way back here. Basically, there are these big folds that, that, that fold them down so that they're exposed at more or less the same elevation uh, back here as, as the greater Himalayan rocks here. Now, there are a couple reasons that I show these images to you. I don't know what your perspective is on what it's like to work in Himalaya. When I was first asked to participate in some research in the Himalaya back in 1998, I think it was, this was my perspective of what fieldwork in the Himalaya was going to be like. I thought we'd have these oxygen masks, and we'd be scaling cliffs and rappelling down cliffs, and there'd be tons of rock everywhere, and it would just be you know, spectacular, and, and well, it is spectacular regardless, but I thought it was going to be you know, this high elevation stuff. And in fact, for a lot of the work that I do, a lot of it is in the lesser Himalaya or, or within the greater Himalaya, and so, some of the fieldwork actually looks a bit like this. <laughs> it can get pretty hot. Uh, down in the lowlands. And I put this up for a couple of reasons. One is that actually we do have, there's places where we have to work pretty hard to find exposure. It's not like this, you know, fantastic, perfectly exposed uh, mountain belt. Um, there's a lot of vegetation. And that sort of brings up the second point, which is where does all of this vegetation, you can see the, the, you know, the vines coming down, where does all this vegetation come from? There's a lot of precipitation at the orogenic front. There is a lot of erosion at the orogenic front. So this concept of channel flow, that there is this erosional removal of material um, that then couples to the weak rocks behind, well, there's certainly focused erosion at the front of the Himalaya today. You can question whether it couples to the weak rocks. You can question how long this has been going on. But certainly from the perspective of, are there conditions anywhere? Does it, has it ever occurred? that you get this focused erosion, the answer is absolutely. There's, there's, it's just unquestionable. Let me run you through and, and show you what some of these rocks are like. I'm going to start structurally low, lesser Himalayan rocks. I'm going to work my way up through greater Himalayan uh, and then Tethian rocks. Um, this is a uh, typical uh, lower grade, lower temperature, um, lesser Himalayan rock. It's a phyllite, sort of a scaly rock. Um, some of these have garnets in them, so technically they're schists, but they're, there's not like a, a lot of garnets. There's some beautiful calc silicates, metamorphosed uh, silic silicic um, limestones. Um, so this is a tremolite marble that's been folded into some beautiful folds. We actually see some um, metamorphosed volcanic rocks in some areas. I love this rock. I, it took me forever to figure out what it was. This is, well, we, we call it a metamorphosed amygdaloidal basalt. <laughs> That's a mouthful. But what it is, you know, when a basalt forms, is extruded at the surface, it has a bunch of bubbles in it. OK? 
Okay, so those holes, that's called a vesicular basalt. So the holes get filled in with minerals called zeolites. And then you get a black rock with little white things in it. Well, that's what happened to this rock. And then it was buried in this mountain belt and metamorphosed. So all this black stuff in here isn't the volcanic glass. It's mainly the mineral hornblende and amphibole. And all this white stuff in here is no longer zeolites. It's a bunch of calcium-rich metamorphic minerals. Um, so this guy started out life as a, as a basalt with you know, a bunch of holes filled in with the zeolite minerals. And now it's a, it's a beautiful amphibolite uh, for us to collect and study. Various other kinds of volcanic rocks. This, I think, is a metamorphosed um, pumice-rich sediment or volcanic rock. These little white streaks that run through here are, I think, are metamorphosed pumice fragments that have been smeared out. So it started out as a volcanic rock. And this, this is an interesting image. So you see these little, these little knots that are here in the rock? I so wanted these to be garnets. There's so much we do in metamorphic petrology that, that uses the chemistry of garnets to figure out temperatures and pressures and things like that. And none of these are garnets. They are all quartz grains. And my interpretation is that these are actually quartz phenocrysts. They're volcanic quartz grains that have been caught up. They're, they're either in a volcanic sediment, volcanogenic sediment or some kind of volcanic rock that when metamorphosed, they left these quartz grains behind and that's what they turned out to be. Um, as we move into the greater Himalayan sequence, lots of quartzite, metamorphosed sandstone. There are a few amphibolites. Um, there are a lot more in the lesser Himalayan sequence. These are, these are actually pretty rare, metamorphosed basalts. Um, there are also calcilicates. So this is now a tremolite and diopside uh, amphibole pyroxene uh, calcilicate. has calcite in it. And then there are these migmatites, partially melted rocks. So here is a melt segregation. It's actually starting to move out of the rock. Here's some of the stuff that's creating the melt. Here's a melt that's, that's in the horizons. So these are the, these are the partially melted rocks. There's, there's no question that these rocks are hot. And then as you step across the South Tibetan detachment system and you get up into the Tethian rocks, then you see, start seeing rocks that look like this. Here's a phyllite. Here's a quartzite. Um, to, to my eye, they're low temperature, lower temperature metamorphic rocks. Now, that's sort of the, the basic stratigraphy, what the rocks look like. Much of what I do focuses on mineral chemistry. And so to do this, we have to identify minerals. Some minerals are really easy to identify in the Himalaya. So here you see these blue blades of, of a mineral that somebody before me kindly identified as kyanite. <laughs> And in case you're wondering, yes, that's my house key. And uh, yes, I left it on the outcrop. But I realized it a kilometer later, ran back, and picked it up. So I was able to get in the house at the, uh, at the end of this trip. Um, but actually, many of the uh, minerals that we uh, look at, we identify in thin sections or microscope slides. So each of these images is, is um, I don't know, five millimeters across, something like that. And what you're looking at here is a garnet with some biotite, brown biotite, green chlorite. Garnet biotite schist. Here's there's, there's that kyanite again, kyanite schist or, uh, or gneiss. Here is a sillimanite K-feldspar, potassium feldspar gneiss. Um, so now we've moved up into the greater Himalayan sequence. We go into the Tethian garnet. Here's some more biotite. There's chloride in this rock. Now we understand as metamorphic petrologists the, the overall conditions, temperatures, and especially, to some degree, pressures at which these mineral assemblages are stable. And so we know that these rocks in the Lesser Himalayan sequence and, and these assemblages in the Tethian Himalayan sequence are around 500, 550 degrees. We know kyanite doesn't form in most rocks until there are temperatures above 600 degrees. And these, rock, and these minerals don't really form until you get to temperatures above 700 degrees. So we can certainly look at this. And we can say, oh, well, temperatures are increasing into the greater Himalayan sequence. We're seeing partial melts in these rocks. And then they decrease into the Tethian Himalayan sequence. But if we want to say something more quantitative, we have to do something different than just looking at, at rocks. Um, I'm going to skip this. That basically says the same thing. So um, the next part of my talk is going to be about 
pressures and temperatures that we measure in metamorphic rocks and how they are similar or dissimilar to these different models, the oozing versus uh, sliding. So let me remind you of the channel flow model. Um, and uh, again, I want to emphasize, you have hot rocks that start out back here in the origin, not very different than critical taper, but they are pushed forward through time so that you get very high temperatures uh, very close to um, the exhumation front. These guys are actually cooling as they're approaching the surface. So they are going down in pressure uh, quite a lot before they cool off. And, and I'll come back to that. The movement of these hot rocks also um, heats up the underlying rocks down here, the lesser Himalayan sequence. And there is also heat transfer into the rocks above. And it's not really that we're not really talking about plutons. We're not talking about you know big massive igneous bodies that are rising like diapirs through through the crust. But my vision of what's been published for the evolution of the rocks above and below the channel is they, they're virtually contact metamorphosed. It's like you put a big light bulb next to it and they started to heat up as, as a consequence. And that is, um, that's different than channel flow. What you see is that the temperatures are high, but they're only back in here. This is overall a lot cooler compared to channel flow. It turns out you can predict the, the pressure temperature evolution. These bounding packages above and below the high temperature core don't look like they're contact metamorphosed. And these rocks that are in the core, why are they cooling off? They're cooling off because they're moving laterally not because they're moving vertically up in this direction. So it's a lateral transport at depth, not a vertical exhumation kind of process. Um, so what I do is, in petrology, is I look at pressure temperature conditions and their evolution. And there are three things that we can look at. We can look at pressure temperature conditions. We calculate these using mineral chemistry, particularly the chemistry of garnet in equilibrium with other minerals in the rock, like the biotite that's there, the chlorite, feldspars, and so on. And so we can just calculate what is the maximum uh, temperature and what is the pressure at that condition that these rocks were formed at. And if we see something that looks pretty hot, then we would say, gosh, that looks like channel flow. If it looks pretty cold, we'd say it sounds more like critical taper. We can look at the pressure temperature paths, especially for these lesser Himalayan and Tethian Himalayan rocks. Do they look like they are contact metamorphosed? And I'll explain more about what that looks like. And we can also look at the pressure temperature paths of the metamorphic core, basically asking the question, do these rocks cool at depth, deep down in the origin, like we would anticipate for critical taper, or near the surface, like we would anticipate from channel flow? Every model has its predictions. So now this is a pressure versus temperature diagram. So this is depth increasing in Earth's crust. This would be around about 55, wait, is that right? Uh, 40, sorry, 45 kilometers depth. Um, 10 kilobars is about uh, 35 kilometers depth. We put mineral stability uh, reactions on these diagrams just for reference. One of them is kyanite versus selenite. Remember those blue blades of kyanite? Well, it has its own stability field, which is back here. And the rock, the thin section I showed you that had selenite in it, the selenite stability field is over here. This is that partial melting reaction that I was talking about, muscovite breakdown to form this melt. And critical taper predicts that you would see relatively cold conditions. So if you pick any pressure, 10 kilobars, 35 kilometers down, and you look at critical taper would predict for the temperature, it is much lower than the temperature that is predicted by channel flow. Okay? So what we can do is we can figure out the pressure temperature conditions from mineral chemistry, plot them on a pressure versus temperature diagram, and basically say, look, are they in the kyanite stability field or are they in the sillimanite stability field? We can also look at distributions of temperature as we go from lesser Himalayan rocks through greater Himalayan rocks and up into eventually up into Tethian Himalayan rocks. Channel flow predicts a uh, channel. <laughs> It predicts a channel. It predicts that you're going to have some peak in temperature. This is our channel that has been exhumed and is bounded by low temperature rocks immediately above and below. And critical taper, there are different models. Each of them has different predictions. But it generally predicts a more distributed uh, 
distributed distribution. <laughs> Great. It, ex it uh, predicts a more distributed uh, series of temperatures as you go through structure. As I said, we emphasize the chemistry of garnet a lot. And if you know much about gem quality uh, garnets, you know that there are different varieties. So there are magnesium rich ones called pyrope. There's, there's actually there's a museum in Italy that's dedicated to the, the mineral pyrope because the purest pyropes in the world are, are from there. Um, spessartine is a manganese mineral. That's the most spectacular picture I've ever seen of a spessartine. Um, almondine, iron rich garnet, grossular, calcium rich garnet. So, you know, we think about the chemistry of garnets. Real garnets, real garnets, these are all real. Natural garnets that I study um, have all four components dissolved into them. So they are chemically complex. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is they are chemically zoned. And it's because different parts of the garnet are recording different positions along their pressure temperature evolution. As they're moving, as the rock is moving through the origin, the garnets are growing, then they can be consumed, and this affects the chemistry. Here's some examples of the chemical zoning that we measure in garnets. So these are garnets, they're a few millimeters across. These are X-ray maps. So what we do is we take an electron beam instrument, we raster an electron beam across this area, kind of like you raster a television, uh, you make television images. And we have um, spectrometers that measure the intensity of manganese x-rays that are excited by that process. And so wherever you see hot colors, that's high concentrations. Wherever you see cool colors, it's low concentrations. So here's a greater Himalayan garnet. It has high manganese on the rim, low manganese in the core, sort of patchy calcium, various other kinds of garnets. You come down to the lesser Himalayan garnets. This one now has high manganese in the core and low manganese on the rim. So it's actually the opposite of this. And these guys are sort of intermediate uh, characters. I don't want to go into all the details of how we interpret which part of the garnet represents which part of its overall evolution, except to say that um, really, in, in large part, thanks to a lot of work that my PhD advisor, Frank Spear, did. There are lots of people who have worked on this, many people who have made many contributions. But Frank Spear spent at least 10 years, maybe even 20, figuring out all the different petrologic processes that give rise to these sorts of zoning. And one of the byproducts of that was to identify what compositions best represent that maximum temperature. And so based on these petrologic criteria, the, the models of how rocks evolve and minerals grow and change composition, we can go to these rocks and we can identify which parts of the garnet we should analyze to get the maximum temperature. How do we get these? We, we use mineral equilibria. We look at things like um, the, the iron magnesium composition of the garnet versus biotite, and that turns out to be temperature sensitive. We can solve for temperature that way. Look at other equilibria and solve for pressure. That's what it looks like. Okay, so here's pressure. Here's temperature, aluminum silicate phase diagram. Here's the prediction of channel of critical taper. Here's the prediction of channel flow. And basically, the rocks are cold. We can also look at distributions. So here is the, the same data from central Nepal. Here's the distribution of temperature um, across structure, lesser Himalayan rocks, greater Himalayan. We didn't get into Tethian here. Channel flow predicts this kind of limited region of, of high temperatures. And this is the distribution that we observe. There is a great paper that um, Chris Spencer and co-authors just published for um, this region the, uh, in Northwest India. There's some, also some data from Kishtwar. The green curve here is the same green curve here. And, and basically, you can see that the, these data line up along the same curve. To me, to my eye, it doesn't really look much like channel flow. Is that what every transect in the Himalaya looks like? No, no. Different places are different. When you look at Everest, there's this big gradient in temperature. And then it's some, somehow it comes down. There's a very steep gradient on the north side. But this really doesn't look like other places in the Himalaya. The Everest region really does seem to be different. If you go to Bhutan, so these are data that I've collected, well, now this distribution of the red data really does look like a channel. But there's one problem with this distribution of data, and that is that none of these temperatures, except for one right there, 
none of these temperatures are above 700 degrees, which is where the partial melts form. And so the channel is only supposed to form where there are melts and the rocks are weak. These rocks are not melted, so they shouldn't be weak and they shouldn't be forming a channel. And in fact, if we plot up the pressure temperature conditions of uh, these rocks on a, on a pressure temperature diagram, then we again find they're well within the kyanite stability field. They're not sitting over here uh, where channel flow would predict. I'll come back to those data at the end of my talk. Um, another thing we can do is if you know the pressure, the depth at which these rocks form, and you, can, and you know the temperature, you can track out where they fall with respect to these different models. And all of the data from central Nepal plot along where we think the trace of the main Himalayan thrust should form. If critical taper is correct, they had better do that. If they don't, there's a big problem. And the reason that they should do that is, think about the particle paths. The rocks are buried under here, and they get transferred to the overriding into the wedge, and then they come back out again. Where do they hit their maximum temperature? It's during this transfer. It's during this transfer. The transfer is occurring across this thrust fault, so the maximum temperature at pressure, at the given pressure, should fall along the thrust, thrust fault, and in fact it does. It doesn't prove critical taper by any means, but at least it's consistent with it. If you try to do this with, um, with channel flow, it's, it's a disaster. And the reason is simply because there's too much heat out here. You can't get these rocks at depth with a low enough temperature. You actually have to push them way out here somewhere. Um, so this is really just a reflection that the rocks are colder than uh, you would anticipate. Let me talk about pressure temperature evolution um, briefly, and I'm going to take, make a brief digression to talk about plutons. So if you think about a, a big body of melted rock, it's deep in the crust, let's say it's 800 degrees, and it rises up, it might cool off a little bit, there'll be some mineral crystallization that buffers the temperature, so it might rise up and still be 800 degrees, might rise up to this level, still be 800 degrees, and only then cools off. Okay, so if you think about this in terms of depth versus temperature, or pressure versus temperature, it's basically rising through Earth's crust till it stalls out at some point, and then it cools off rapidly. So it undergoes isothermal exhumation. The rocks on, that, that it's passing by or stall or lands next to, these guys are going to heat up, and they're going to heat up at constant pressure. And so what you see are isobaric heating paths that are predicted in this sort of pluton model. Now, we can also think about um, multiple thrust surfaces. So here's some package of rocks. Here's, here's a rock that gets buried underneath this thrust. So it comes down here. It might sit there for a little while. If it sits there, it'll heat up a little bit. And if there's some erosion, the pressure might go down. But basically, as the thrust cuts up underneath it and adds this to the wedge, it gets transferred into this part of it and then as this thrust sheet is moving upward, it exhumes. Okay, so we know that the pressure temperature paths, here's pressure versus temperature, um, it gets buried during this part. Um, if it sits around for a little bit, it might, uh, it might exhume and heat up a little bit, but not by very much, a couple tens of degrees C. Then after the transfer, it's, it's basically going back up the pipes. It's, uh, it's decreasing in pressure and decreasing in temperature. So you end up with a, with a uh, hairpin curve or something that looks a little bit like this. Garnets tend to grow on heating. This is something that we can determine. So this part in red are parts of the pressure temperature path that we can recover. The parts in green are very difficult to recover. So this is to summarize the predictions. So here, the, in, in these curves, pressure versus temperature, the, the solid curves here are the predictions of channel flow. This is taken straight out of the literature. And what you see is the greater Himalayan rocks, they kind of look like a pluton. They exhume isothermally, and then they cool off. This is because they're coming towards the thrust front. They're moving up towards the thrust front. They don't cool off initially until they're close to the surface, and then they cool off like a shot. And the rocks on either side, the Tethian Himalayan rocks, lesser Himalayan rocks, show this big isobaric heating. And I mean a lot, like a couple hundred degrees. That's what the predictions show. And the critical taper shows something different. It predicts these hairpin curves or maybe a little bit of heating. If you end up way below the flat part of it, a part of the, um, the thrust system, then you can get some isobaric 
heating and isobaric uh, cooling. But this is occurring very deep. This is deep in the origin. How do we calculate these, um, these different paths? Um, for the lower grade rocks, we, we use the zoning that's present in the garnet. So if you followed even a little bit of what I was saying before, we use the, the, the chemistry, it turns out in these rocks, the chemistry of the rim of the garnet to figure out the maximum temperature. So if this chemistry represents the temperature at which garnet growth ceased, then this chemistry represents the conditions at which garnet growth started. And another thing that my PhD advisor at RPI did was to um, show how you can invert the chemical zoning that we see in these different components to figure out the pressure temperature history that produced the growth of this garnet. Greater Himalayan rocks, it's much harder. Um, these uh, growth profiles are no longer preserved. And so we have, to, um, we have to infer this indirectly. We basically look at the temperature time history and where they are in the origin. Um, to cut a long story short, these are the pressure temperature paths that we calculate. So if you look at the lesser Himalayan rocks, the Tethian Himalayan rocks, they, a lot of these show an increase in pressure and temperature, and then they just stop. That's what we would predict for a hairpin curve. Some of them show a little bit of heating with exhumation, um, but not large degrees of heating. And then the greater Himalayan rocks look like they're cooling at depth, pressures of like 12 kilobars, so that's over, that's close to 40 kilometers, 35 kilometers, and so on. These data are more consistent with critical taper than channel flow, in, in my view, at least where I've, where I've worked on this. So the take-home message from petrology doesn't look like channel flow, looks like critical taper. Now, another aspect of this is we can look at the, the cooling history of these rocks. So think about when these partially melted rocks cool below 700 degrees and crystallize. In channel flow, they cool very close to the thrust front. In critical taper, they cool very far from the thrust front. So these should cool later, uh, relatively late. These should cool relatively early. Relatively late or relatively early compared to what? Well, compared to the rocks that are directly underneath them. So we can look at the, the age of metamorphism of these rocks, look at the age of crystallization of these rocks, compare those over here, and they, will be, they uh, will, are predicted to be different. So here's the channel flow model. Here is the maximum temperature reached by, this is the peak of metamorphism reached by the underlying rocks. That's the age. Here's the age of melt crystallization, and they're actually slightly inverted. Um, but regardless, they're very close together. If you look at the age of melt crystallization versus metamorphic ages over here, these guys crystallize long before they ever see those rocks. It's because they're crystallizing way back in the origin. They haven't been moved forward. How do we measure this? We measure this mainly using the mineral monazite. Um, here's a beautiful picture of a monazite. Monazite is a light rare earth element phosphate. Um, the lanthanides along here constitute most of the rare earths. These are the light rare earths. Thorium and uranium are geochemically similar to some of the light rare earths. So monazite takes up a lot of thorium and uranium. Thorium and uranium are radioactive. They decay to lead, so we can measure the lead contents, thorium and uranium contents, get the age of monazite formation. However, guess what? Monazite is a metamorphic mineral. Metamorphic minerals are chemically zoned. So we have to put together models of how the chemical zoning in the monazite reflects the reaction history. And to cut a long story short here, um, we know that certain chemical characteristics, low thorium and low yttrium on the rims of these uh, monazites or domains in monazite, represent those um, portions that grew closest to the highest temperature. So this is the peak metamorphic temperature in the underlying rocks. And we can look at these rocks from migmatites, these high yttrium rims um, reflect the monazite that crystallized from the melt. And so this is exactly what we want. We can identify the prograde metamorphic, peak metamorphic monazites in the rocks underneath, measure their ages. We can measure the crystallization ages here and look at those and see are they similar, which is channel flow, or are they different, which would be critical taper. This is just a distribution of monazite ages. Give you a sense. There are monazites of all different ages, but we identify chemically that these are melt crystallization ages. These are peak metamorphic ages. We can plot these up. 
on a temperature time diagram. So here's temperature versus time. So these are the predictions of channel flow, and here are the measured ages. And the crystallization ages predate the peak metamorphic ages. In fact, it's a very close match for what you would predict from a critical taper. And so the take-home message for the rocks I've worked on from geochronology is we don't really see a lot of uh, evidence for unusual heat transport. We don't see that age inversion. Um, the data are generally consistent with critical taper, and that means that we're looking at snow plows and not pistons for sliding and not oozing. Um, just in the last couple of minutes, I do want to address this question, why is there a South Tibetan detachment system? That's one of the nice things about channel flow. It explains why you get this big shear uh, up at the top of the Himalaya. Critical taper doesn't really do that very well. We have some data from central, Na uh, central Nepal, central Bhutan. Here's Bhutan. It's these Tethian rocks here in green. We have transects from the greater Himalayan rocks in pink into these Tethian Himalayan rocks. I know you can't see any of these numbers, and I can't even see them <laughs> standing this close. But everywhere you see a little blue box, that's where we've calculated a pressure temperature condition from these metamorphic rocks. So the South Tibetan detachment system is way back here. It's been inferred to be underneath these outliers. Um, but until we went in there, no one had studied the metamorphism. And one of the things we see is that temperature, you look at temperature versus structural distance, and it's basically a straight shot. There's no evidence that you see discontinuities in temperature. Now, if you have a shear zone, a discrete horizon, that undergoes a lot of displacement, then normally what you would anticipate seeing is some discontinuity in temperature. You either see, you, what you would expect to see here is a, a lot of high temperature rocks and then a jump to lower temperature rocks. We don't see that. It, it is as, as continuous as these data ever get. Now, what is more interesting about all of this isn't so much the temperatures as the pressures. Now, one of the things you see is that the pressures basically are a straight shot, pressure versus distance. But what's interesting about this is this section of rock is 10 kilometers thick. Okay, if you take 10 kilometers of rock and you, you, know, you get the pressure at, at each position, you turn it on its side so, that you, so it's at the surface and you can measure all these things, a 10 kilometer thick section of crust should differ in pressure from the bottom to the top by three kilobars. A bar is an atmospheric pressure, but three kilobars. And what we measure is more like six kilobars. So what does that mean? It means that you establish these pressures in these rocks over a crustal thickness that's 20 kilometers. Those rocks cool sufficiently that they're not going to re-equilibrate and then you squash it into a sequence that's 10 kilometers thick. And you don't cut it up with a bunch of extensional shears. You do this homogeneously because the distribution of pressures is homogeneous through this section. And so now we're thinking that what's really going on here is that there's, you know, the, the wedge develops, you, you create something that's, that's really thick, you change some parameter um, you can weaken this, this basal shear. You can do something back here in Tibet. There are changes that happen in Tibet. And basically, the whole thing squashes down. It flattens out. And there are places where you get discrete shears, which would be you know, the shear zones, South Tibetan attachment system. And there are places where it's more homogeneous, which is where we would be looking at in, uh, in Bhutan. So to finish up here with the migmatite in the, in the background, I, I don't find a lot of support for channel flow in the data that I've collected. I, I want to emphasize again, I've only been to a few places in the Himalaya. I think there are other places that have better evidence um, for channel flow, but not the data that, that I've collected. Um, I do think critical taper really does explain most of the data most of the time. So in other words, <laughs> sliding is a good explanation for the data rather than oozing. Um, but I think that flattening or the squashing process may be important to understanding what's, what's going on with the distribution of rocks in the Himalaya. And then the last thing I want to say about, um, about this particular topic is, you know, all the data I've collected, they, they give the same answer. You know, it's not like I look at one set of data and I get one answer and I go and look at a different set of data and I get a different answer. They're all pretty consistent with each other. They all seem to come down on one side of the equation. Um, and I'm actually surprised. That doesn't happen in my line of research very often. 
The only uh, last thing I would like to say is I want to uh, present my acknowledgments. All of this work has been funded by the US National Science Foundation. Thank you, National Science Foundation. There are lots of people who have worked with me on this, collaborators and students and, and so on. The Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology provided logistical support in uh, Northwest India. Department of Mines of Geology in, uh, in Bhutan. Um, I want to thank Mineralogical Society of America for paying my way. And I want to thank Boise State University for letting me come out here. And I would like to thank you all for listening to my talk. That was complicated, wasn't it? Yeah. Now, I'm sure you've got some questions for Matt. Yeah. Oh, far away. Oh, well, microphone, microphone. microphone. Do you need a microphone? <laughs> I have one comment and one question. Yeah. The comment is that I think there's one parameter that didn't figure at all in your talk, and that is the changing volume uh, that takes place when you uh, release water and CO2 from, com from the combined situation uh, in the mineral, in the stru um, mineral structure. Uh, I showed in a paper in 2008 rigorous thermodynamics that show the volume increase per joule that you then get is over 20 times more than you would get with thermal expansivity. So this really means to say that your hot stuff is not just for squeezing, but it's actually getting bigger because it's being made hot. And that's why it's finding release in the least direction of least uh, restraint, namely to the south where the topography allows that. Now the other question is what do you, the question is, is what do you comment about Nanga Parbat? About Nanga Parbat? Yeah. Well, if, for those of you who don't know, Nanga Parbat is the northwest corner of the Himalaya. Yeah. It's an amazing place. So the, the, um, the faults come up into a corner and they take a very sharp bend and they run down to the south. So it's a, a geologically unusual place. You know, all I can say is what I've read in the literature. There seem to be um, very large structures that are allowing this to sort of pop up. As it comes up, it undergoes melting reactions. So there are very low temperature reactions that occur. Sure, there are lots of places where you can see very localized phenomena that are, um, I wouldn't call that channel flow. I would say, you know, there's a, there's a pop-up structure there. It's, that's, that's a technical term that I shouldn't use in this context. But basically, the rocks are, are coming up in a, in a little chunk, and they're undergoing melting reactions as a, as a result of that. Um, to get back to your question about you, you know, thermal expansivities and, and the, the volume changes, sure, there are volume changes, but they, they're not very large. I've done these calculations. You lose a little bit of volume by producing water, but the water get, gets lost from the system. And the volume of the anhydrous rock is not significantly different. I've looked at the solubilities of the different elements in that fluid, and again, you might lose a couple percent in the volume of the rock, but it's not a huge effect. And then there, the, the melt that's produced is a little bit higher volume, but there, you know, all reactions have a change in volume in them, and that doesn't necessarily drive um, this kind of flow. I think what's important, and, and I, I, maybe I didn't make this, this as clear as I should have, again, no one is disputing that there are soft rocks there. For them to flow, they have to have some place to go. They have to have some place to go. And what channel flow says is, I'm removing stuff, and the stuff is, and the and the soft rocks are flowing in to, to fill it in. That's not the only way to replace that. Um, certainly, you could have flow in other directions too. All I'm saying is that in the places that I've looked, um, I don't see that evidence for for flow. The, the thermal consequences of what that flow would would create. But if they, what, you are, your loss, what, what you're detaching from the combination material actually can happen. You've got a lid on it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a lid on it. Yeah, well, so, you know, you're looking at the chocolate lava cake, but you didn't bite into it. <laughs> so. Then let's move to the left. I saw, yeah. ah, there we are. Hi. Um, I think in recent years there's been a lot of you know channel flow versus critical taper, mm -hmm. and maybe now in the so the last few Himalayan talks I've been to, people are saying, well, maybe both of these things coexist either through time, you know, certain times has been critical taper, others has been channel flow, or maybe throughout the origin in different, maybe we have um, critical taper in the lesser Himalaya and 
and channel flow in the Great Himalaya. I suppose what I wanted to ask what you think is the future of going through these models and what you think are the critical questions we need to ask in the Himalayas and what is the future of Himalayan geology? Well, wow, that's a lot to cover in uh, you know 30 <laughs> seconds. So that's a good question. So um, let's see where to start. So with respect to you know critical taper behavior in the frontal part of the wedge, I've I've heard nothing directly, but I've heard that people um, will argue that I'm looking in the front of the wedge, and so I'm seeing critical taper. That's not the point. That's not the point. I am looking at rocks that are above and below the channel. If the channel is flowing, it carries heat. You should see a thermal consequence. And I don't see that thermal consequence. So that's that's all I'm saying. I, I would not um, argue the point that there could be channel flow in other parts of the origin. I, you know, I just spent a couple of days talking with a friend of mine about high temperatures in the Sikkim region. That's between Bhutan and and eastern Nepal, and that be, may be viable there. So people people would argue that point. But I see no problem with having different mechanisms that are operative in different parts of the origin. I think you know it really comes back to this fundamental question to sure there's going to be some flow but is this a significant component that controls the overall evolution of the origin and I think we need to collect more data especially from the Tethyan emollient sequence where we have very little metamorphic information I think that's absolutely crucial to understand how this origin is evolving and try to say look you know, if there's if there's channel flow, is this really significant? I mean, is this something we need to talk about, or is it just you know something that's not all that important? And the same thing for for critical taper. So, are you going to avoid the question of the future of Himalayan geology? <laughs> you have thirty seconds. <laughs> so I will just say, I will just say that I started in Himalayan geology when I was a postdoc. I was I was uh, I was bribed into joining this research group. It was it was it was a good thing for me to do, in, in the promise of going to the Himalaya. And I was sure it was like the only time I was going to go to the Himalaya. It was just a one-off kind of project. I am still writing proposals to work in the Himalaya 15 years later. So, um, I, you know, there are lots of things. Um, what I'm always excited about in in studying tectonics isn't always, you know, can we solve the problem of the day, it's can we develop new ways of thinking about origins. And uh, you know, I mentioned briefly these calcilicates. It turns out that we have recently discovered there's all new things that we can do with calcilicates in terms of metamorphic petrology and geochronology. And I think you know the Himalaya is a test ground, but the, the thing is it allows us to go back into these ancient origins and do more and more and more. So from my perspective, I'm always interested in developing new techniques for looking at mountain belts, and there will always be a place for that. So maybe not the best of the answers, but that's my perspective on it. Yeah. Please, we'll make this the last one. Uh, uh, I'm a little uh, lost on the, f yeah. the direction of flow. Uh, if I understood it correctly, uh, there's flow from India, if you like, pushing the mountains up into Tibet. Okay. And if I understood it correctly, you had your hot flow going from Tibet down into India. Have I, have I got it wrong? I think you've got it a little bit backwards. So India, so if we think about this is India and this is Asia, the Indian plate is going down underneath Tibet. And there is a wedge of material that's being heated Different people argue about why it gets so hot, but there's no question that it was hot. And so the argument then is that that is back flowing towards the uh, towards the Indian continent, towards the towards the thrust front. There's a lot of thrusting that goes on. A lot of rocks are being transported, and that of course is the question: Are the hot rocks simply being carried passively on thrusts, which is what critical taper would say? Are they sort of flowing under their own regime of of you know, plastic behavior, which is what what channel flow would be. I hope that answers your <coughs> question. Well, OK, we can, we can talk in more detail. The next thing to flow is wine in the lower library. <laughs> I like that. So let's thank Matt again for his uh, most interesting talk.